Hey, this is Math 8, Unit 8, Lesson 5, Reasoning About Square Roots. And so today we're going to approximate square roots. It means kind of get close to what we think their value is going to be. We can't get exact because the square roots are irrational, right? It goes on and on forever. So first of all, true or false, decide if your statement is true or false. We have the square root of 5 squared equals 5. This is a statement where we would say that's going to be true, and that's because when you square a square root, they're both eliminated, so 5 equals 5. This would be a true statement. All right, the square root of 9 squared, is that going to be true or false? In this case here, this would be a false statement, and the reason for that is that the square root of 9 is actually 3, and then when you have to take the 3 and square it, you end up back with 9. So that's going to be a false statement there. Here, we have a square and a square root. Those are gonna be canceling one another out. So seven will equal seven. That is a true statement. Right here, we have uh, square root of 10 squared. Again, the squared cancels the square root out. Does 10 equal 100? No, it does not. So that is a false statement. And here, the square root of 16 is actually four. And then two squared is also four. So a couple extra steps there, but that is a true statement right there as well. So some trues and some false. It's just how that one works out. Okay, moving down to 5.2. Square root values. What two whole numbers does each square root lie between? All right, be prepared to explain your reasoning. So square root of seven. What you wanna think about is the square roots that you actually do know. So for example, we know the square root of four is equal to two. And we know the square root of nine is equal to three. The square root of seven is in between that, so it's gonna be between two and three. For 23, we know that the square root of 16 is equal to four. And we also know that five squared is 25, so the square root of 25 is five. And so 23, root of 23 is gonna lie in between four and five. For 50, I'm gonna go with seven times seven is 49. So the square root of 49 is seven. And 50 is gonna be in between there. So let's look at the one that's for eight. Well, that would be 64. And then finally over here for 98, I know that uh, the square root of 81 equals nine, just as the square root of 100 equals 10. So the square root of 98 is gonna go in between 9 and 10. And that's what we have right there. Okay, so can we do better than that? The question here is, are you ready for more? Is, is can we do better than between 3 and 4 for the square root of 12? And explain a way to figure out the value is closer to 3.1 or 3.9. And to work on that, I mean, what we say is, yeah, we could probably do better than that. And the reason for that is that if the square root of 9 is 3 and the square root of 16 is 4, if we're talking about square root of 12, you're talking about between 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. You're putting, plotting this one right there. So you're between, you have 10, 11, let's say you're going down two and then going down two there. So the halfway point would be 12.5. So three and a half is where you have 12.5. Now 12 is a little less than that, so we'd probably actually go with a little less than 3.5 and say, yeah, let's go about 3.4. It's definitely closer to 3.1, right, than it is to 3.9, because we have 9, 10, 11, 12, and here we have, so there's two between the 12 and the 9, and 16, there's three between the 12 and the 16. So we would say it's closer to 3.1 and probably about 3.4 if we had to do an estimation there. All right, sorry, my kitten is walking through the projector today because I came home to do some work. So yep, how you doing, Kevin? Having a good day? Okay, so let's move on to 5.3. It says the numbers, oops, gotta move it down there. The numbers x, y, and z are positive. x squared equals three, y squared equals 16, and z squared equals 30. Plot x, y, and z on the number line and be prepared to share your reasoning with the class. So we wanna have a number that we square and end up with three, just like we square and end up with 16 and square and end up with 30. 
One of the first things we can do is pretty easy. It would be this one right here, y squared equals 16, because we know that 4 times 4 is equal to 16. So that one's pretty easy to figure out, right? That y equals 4. When it comes to the other ones, it's one of those, it's going to be in between something, isn't it, right? So we want to get something that squared gets as close to 3. We know that 1 squared gets you to 1, and 2 squared gets you to 4. Well, we want to get to 3, right? So we're looking for a number between 1 and 2. So it's going to be some sort of decimal number. But it's certainly closer to, I mean, 3 is closer to there. So you have in between 1 and 4 is a 2 and a 3. So we would say it's greater than probably 1.5 and, you know, less than 2. So we would say greater than 1 and a half. 1 and a half is here and less than 2. So maybe about there. Again, we're just estimating. Uh, for where x is going to be and your job is to share your reasoning. So why put x there? Well because 2 squared is 4 and 1 squared is 1 and so this is going to be 3 be a little bit more than 1 and a half so that's why I put it right there. Now for z squared something similar has to take place right? I know that 5 squared is going to be 25 I know 6 squared is going to be 36 I want to get to 30 so again I'm going to be between 5 and 6 and in this case here, it's almost right in the middle, right? 30, the difference between this is 5 and here is 6. So we're pretty close to being in the middle. So we could put a, put a point right there and say, let's put Z right there between 5 and 6. Now number 2 asks you to plot negative root 2 on the number line. All right, that's a little different there. Now root 2, we've seen before that square root of 2 is, if I remember right, it's, it's you know a little more between 1 and 2, right? because the square root of 1 is 1 and the square root of 4 is 2 so we have the square root of 2, the square root of 3 are going to be there so it's going to be somewhere between all those if this is 1.5 that's about the halfway point we could say it's about a 1.2 again we're just estimating here what this might be 1.25 it doesn't really matter for our case here but the square root of 2 is about 1.2 something or other but this negative sign means Whatever I decide that value is going to be, I'm going to make it negative. So if I say the square root of 2 is equal to 1.2, let's just say that's what we're going to say it's going to be for now, I then have to transfer this negative over and make that a negative 1.2. So where would that be? That's going to be negative 1.2 somewhere about here for negative root 2. Just like that. Okay, and that's the idea. So in summary, we can approximate the values of square roots by observing the whole numbers around it. And remember the relationships between square roots and squares. So here are some examples, right? So six, square root 65 is a little more than 8 because 65 is a little more than 64. And square root 64 is 8. So knowing what you know about some numbers can help you figure out approximately where things are going to go. Alrighty, so that's today's lesson. Let's take a moment here to pause, work on your homework, and then come back and press play and see how you did. All right, number one. Explain how you know that the root 37 is a little more than 6. Again, you're going to want to explain this in your words. So you have to write out a, a written ex explanation here, okay? The reason you would know that is because, for example, 6 times 6 is equal to 36. Therefore, the square root of 36 is equal to 6. So because the square root of 37 is a little bit more than that, it's going to be a little more than 6 as well. We can use some similar logic here on B. How do you know that root 95 is a little less than 10? Well, 10 times 10 is 100. So the square root of 100 is 10. The square root of 95 then has to be a little less than 10 because the square root of 95 is a smaller number than root 100. For C, how do you know that root 30 is between 5 and 6? Well, that's because root 25 is 5, root 36 is 6, and root 30 comes in between those two there to help me see that it comes between 5 and 6. Let's plot each number now on the number line. So 6 is going to go right here where it has 6, no problem there. 7.5 is going to go right about here at 7.5, no problem. I like root 64 because the square root of 64 is simply 8. So I can put this here and write go root 64. 
Now I have a couple I need to, to estimate with, right? So square root of 83, square root of 83. Well, which, which ones do I know? I know square root of 81 is nine. And so if that's nine, then I go back to eight and the square root of 64 is eight. Oops, I wanna go the other way, my mistake. So let's erase this real quick. Because 83 is bigger than 81. Sorry about that. So the root 81 here is nine. So here is square root of 100 equals 10. So the square root of 83 will be what? Between nine and 10, but closer to nine. So I'm gonna put a dot right there and we'll call that the square root of 83. For the square root of 40, we do something similar. Okay, square root of 40. Well, what do I know? I know the square root of 36 equals six. The square root of 49 equals seven. So I know I'm between six and seven. It's about four away from there, nine away from there. So we're definitely closer to six and the seven. So I could put a square root or a dot right there and say, let's call this a square root of 40, just above the six. All right, number three. Mark and label the position of two square root values between seven and eight on the number line. All right, so we can do this here. Let's think about this. If I have the number seven, that is actually the square root of 49, and eight, I could use the square root of, sorry, 64. So I can use any square root value between 49 and 64, and it would end up right about there. Right, so if I decided to put the square root of 51, I could put it right there. If I want to do the square root of 60, I could put it right there. And up to you which numbers you want to pick. Those are just ones I threw out there for you. As long as it's between 49 and 64, you will be just fine. All right, let's look at number four. Number four, it asks us to select all the irrational numbers on the list. Remember, a ra ratio number has a ratio with it. So this is gonna be a rational number, has a ratio. That's a ratio, so it's rational, okay? Square root of 14, right? The square roots that I know, I know square root of one, square root of four, square root of nine, square root of 16, square root of 25, square root of 36, square root of 49, right? How are we doing so far? Square root of 64, square root of 81, and square root of 100 are the ones we're working with so far. So 14, that would be irrational. It comes right about there, somewhere between three and four. Square root of 64 is actually gonna be equal to eight, so that's a rational number. This is a funny one to think about. It's square root of nine over one. Well, what is nine over one? Nine over one is simply nine. Square root of nine is three. So that is a rational number, actually. So I don't need to circle it. <laughs> All right. Uh, negative square root of 99. Well, 99 is close to 100, but it's not 100, so that's going to be irrational. And this last one here, square root of 100, is going to be 10, and it ends up being negative 10, and that is just fine. That's a rational number there. Number five. Each grid square represents one square unit. What's the exact side length of the shaded square? All right, so to do this one we've done before is we take our pencil and we draw a larger square around this diagonal square. We determine the area of the larger square is one, two, three, four, five. So the area of the larger square is equal to 25 because it's five times five, five times five. And then we have to subtract the triangle parts, right? Our triangle part in this case here, we have a three by two. And so two triangles together form that rectangle, that, that shape, which has an area of six, but there are two of them. So six times two is 12, so we're gonna subtract 12. Five minus two is three, two minus one is one. So my area is 13, so our side length then becomes the square root of 13. And again, the reason for that is, if you recall, square root of 13 times square root of 13, right? The length times the width is gonna equal our area, and we already determined our area to be 13. So the root times the root makes the roots go away, and you're left with just the 13. Number six, for each pair of numbers, which of the two numbers is larger, and estimate how many times larger? All right, in order to compare, it's important to have the same um, you know, base 10 here. So that's a six, that's a four. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move this one down 
and I'm going to move this one up. So let's rewrite this here. By moving that down means I'm going to move the decimal, in this case here, one to the right moves that down. So this becomes 3.7 times 10 to the fifth. Okay, and we're going to compare this to, I want to move this up one. So because I'm moving up one, I'll move the decimal to the left. So this becomes 70 times 10 to the fifth. So in terms of which one is larger, we would say that the 70 one is larger. How much times larger, how many, how many times larger is it? Well, you're talking about about four times what gets you to 70. You know, you could say 20 times larger. You could divide if you wanted to, up to you. Again, it's estimating how much time larger it is. So uh, my book says it's about 20 times larger for that one. Okay, this next one. Um, let's put them in, it doesn't really matter. We can keep it in base four here and we can have a 4.87 times 10 to the fourth. And we're gonna compare that to, okay, we're gonna move this down, which means move the decimal over one more. So we're gonna compare it to 150 times 10 to the fourth. Because my base is the same, I can compare. So that's about five compared to 150. We would say that, that one's still bigger. So five times what gets you to 150? Uh, about 30 times larger. All right, and our next one here. All right, this one is already five times 10 to the fifth. All right, so if we wanna make these the same, we can make this into the fifth by moving this to the, this place. We're gonna go down three, so move this down. So let's write this again. We have five times 10 to the fifth, and we're gonna move our decimal, one, two, three, right? That's a one, two, three, and that makes that times 10 to the fifth. So 2,300 compared to five. I'm gonna go with this one is a little bit bigger, right? How much bigger is it? Oh, it's about, we would say here, about 500 times bigger. Why go with 500? Well, let's pretend this is about 2,500. So five times five gets you 25, and add a couple more zeros to make up for that right there. All right, and our last one. We have a scatter plot that's gonna show us the heights in inches and three-point percentages for different basketball players this season. So we're looking at how tall the player is and how well they make three-point shots. All right, so here's our chart. Three-point percentage here and the player's height. Circle any data points that appear to be outliers. Well. I would say that is an outlier. It just doesn't seem to fit anywhere. Are there other ones? No, the rest are fairly close. I would say that's your only one. Compare any outliers to the values predicted by the model. Well, if I compare this to the other ones, I would say it's significantly worse than what the model predicted. It should be a lot better, right? This person at 85 inches, the model would say they should have uh, their percentage should be about 30%. So they should be at 30%, but they're actually at 15%. That's a lot worse than what it should be. It's about you know, 50% less, you're cutting in a half, 30 to 15. So this person's not doing too well, maybe practice a little bit more. That's it for today. Have a great one, we'll see you next time.